Welcome. Welcome to a day of lofty dreams and inspiration. For those of you who are new to Unitarian Universalism, you've come to a place that very intentionally welcomes all. You are welcome here without exceptions related to your beliefs, who you love, what you look like, or any other way we humans are diverse. We are a denomination created by people of diverse beliefs with the common desire to journey together as we explore life's big questions and to work together to make the world more just and more sustainable. I'm Mary Van Valen and Pam Hendrick and I are coordinating the service today. Our wonderful interim minister, Kathy Harrington, is here and will be back up here in front next week. Thank you, Kathy. We are so grateful that you ventured out on this blustery winter day to join us. And before we continue, we're going to have an announcement by John Hoffman. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good morning. <clears throat> I'm John Hoffman, and uh, I serve the congregation this year as a member of the transition team. Uh, the transition team is one of the key components of the interim ministry process. Uh, we're a specific group selected to assist the interim minister and the congregation in the reflection and intentional organizational work needed to prepare for a new settled minister. The members of the transition team, uh, besides myself, are Tom Darton, Susan Leo, Kat Norman, and of course, uh, Reverend Kathy, our interim minister. One week from today, next Sunday, the January 19th, our transition team will host an important congregational gathering to introduce and begin the process of selecting a new settled minister for the UUCGT, our congregation. The process is managed by the uh, UUA, the parent organization, and is designed to achieve good matches between candidates and congregation while ensuring fairness and confidentiality. There are strict timelines and content requirements. It is a good and a great source of comfort for us that Reverend Kathy has already had experience leading congregations through this process. A key element of the process is the appointment and empowering of a search committee. Sunday, January 19th, from noon until two o'clock, we will learn more about the search process and begin the steps needed to empower a search committee. We would welcome you registering in advance. There are some forms out there at the welcome table, uh, the inst so, and you can uh, leave it there at the in in uh, welcome table where there is a box. I would also make a note that for parents who want to stay, if you need childcare, please indicate so on the form so that we can uh, provide for childcare. So uh, this is a note of encouragement. I would hope that as many of you as possible can join us next Sunday, January 19th, to uh, learn more about, about the process and provide your input. Thanks a lot. We'd like to continue our welcome by asking if anyone is new here and comfortable standing and introducing themselves, we'd like to welcome you. Are there new faces in the crowd? Hi, my name is Welcome, Kate. We're glad you're here. Any other newcomers? You're most welcome all. If you'd like to know more about Unitarian Universalism, the friendliest people are at the welcome table in the hall. And you can have them steer you to activities or information you might be interested in. If you have a joy or a concern, you're welcome to write it in the book. It's being demonstrated as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
Those will be read later in the service. And if you have a joy or a concern that you would not like to share with the group, but that you'd like to light a candle for, you may do that at any time. After the service, um, the Peace and Justice Advocacy Center and Citizens Climate Change will have information at tables in the lobby. And if you'd like to know more about these wonderful nonprofits, you're invited to go there. So this morning, we are honoring Martin Luther King's legacy with part of his I Have a Dream speech and also the I Have a Dream speeches of three brilliant and passionate community leaders. Bill Latka is filming this so that we will have a record for all time. Thank you, Bill. We also welcome T.C. Sings, who take up the entirety of the first three rows. <laughs> And their director, Heather Hingham, you, we are so grateful you're here. They will sing near the end of the service with the VE to the drumbeat of Rick Evans. So I would say it's time to fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> With humility and courage born of our history, we are called as Unitarian Universalists to build the beloved community where all souls are welcome as blessings and the human family lives whole and reconciled. With this vision in our hearts and minds, we light our chalice. because we will be sounding our singing bowl now, and that is to help us focus all of our thoughts and energies on the dreams we share today for a better world. If you'll open your gray hymnals uh, to the responsive reading, number 584, our opening words are going to be read responsively, and they are, of course, by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. We must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. Before it is too late, we must narrow the gaping chasm between our proclamations of peace and our lowly deeds which precipitate and perpetuate war. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. We shall hew out the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if the children, the young and the young of heart, would like to come forward, we have um, a little bit of a story today. How are you this morning? Is it on? Yes, you can hear me. Good. Good. Um, so, uh, this is kind of a different story. It's not a once upon a time story. What, what's a once upon a time story? A fairy tale. A fairy tale, right. <laughs> and so, instead, today, uh, we're going to tell you a little bit of a true story. A little bit of a true story about Martin Luther King. Now, do you recognize that name? But you do, right? Because you'll probably be talking about him in school in the next weeks because we are celebrating his birthday. And he was a very important leader in our country when he was alive. And that's why we have a national holiday to celebrate his birthday. So we're going to talk a little bit about something that happened way back in 1963. And that was a long time ago. I was just a young girl at the time, but I remember it very well. And there was a huge march on Washington, the capital of the country. And it was a march that thousands of people took part in. And the march was called the March for Jobs and Freedom. And thousands of people were there because they believed that our government wasn't doing enough to make sure that we all, all people, had the freedoms that were promised to us in our laws and in our Constitution. And there weren't enough good jobs, especially for poor people, jobs where they could earn enough money so that they could give their families enough food and a nice place to live. Uh, so thousands of people took part in that. And Martin Luther King was a leader of the black community, and he was there to talk about how hard life was for the black people in our country. They often had the worst jobs. They didn't pay enough, or no jobs at all. So, and they often didn't have the freedoms that we are supposed to have in this country. The freedom to go to the school they want to go to, to live where they want to live to have the jobs that they want to have. Um, sometimes they didn't have the freedom to vote. Um, and so Dr. Martin Luther King was there. He was a wonderful preacher. And he was there to talk about all these hardships that black people had in our country. And his speech was very powerful. And he talked about the injustices. And he talked about how things needed to get better for black people and for all people in this country. And people listened to that speech. They were listening to every word he had to say. But the most famous part of the speech came at the very end. Because at the very end of the speech, Martin Luther King said that we must not become filled with hate for the people who made us suffer and who did bad things to us. Instead, what we needed to do was hold in our heart love. And through love, we needed to dream about a better future where all people are created equal and have the same rights. And so that speech became known as the I Have a Dream speech. And it's been famous all over the world. And every year, we go back to that speech and listen to it new and let it inspire us. And so that you remember about the I Have a Dream speech, we have Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream boxes for you. We have his picture on, and it says, I have a dream along the side. Inside, there are pieces of paper for you to write your dream. Mm -hmm. and all the dreams you have for a better world. Thank you. Yes. I want you to know that at some point in your life, 
you have more good dreams for the world than will fit in this little box, you come and see me. I will build you a big box because we want all dreams to be accommodated. Okay? So help yourself to an I have a dream box. And then we're going to sing you on your way. <coughs> Good morning. Um, I am not Sylvia, but I am Judith Briggs, and I serve on the Congregational Care Committee, and it's my privilege to read the joys and concerns for today. Sorry to lose, sorry to lose our community center and gathering place, Horizon Books, after almost 60 years of being our special place for so many years serving the needs beyond book selling from Dave and Kate booksellers. Well, this is sad news to me also. Well, it's just Petoskey. It's just Petoskey. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, we have another. <laughs> My Heather Shoemaker also wrote, my heart, my heart is heavy with the news about our beloved Horizon books. Not easy to create what they have nurtured and created. Thank you. And I have an, a note, a candle for my son, Tim Schokling. Golnick. 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 It turns 39 today as he continues his struggles. That's from Ken Greeby. And I guess that's. We say in our church that the offering is a sacrament of the free church. What we mean by that is that we believe it is a blessing to be able to govern and support our religious community ourselves. To make possible by our generosity everything we dream of and do to live out our shared values. Every week we lift up the spiritual value of generosity by taking an offering for the ministries of this church. Our baskets then, as they are passed among us, become filled with the evidence of that generosity. It is our harvest gathered in every week for what most nourishes us. The ushers will now come among you to receive the gifts of the congregation. Our baskets have two sides. Uh, the blue side is for the congregation. The red side supports many of the worthy projects um, that we support in the community, such as Safe Harbor for the Homeless, uh, a free community lunch, uh, the Women's Resource Center, um, just to name a few. The offering will now be gratefully given and received.
I Have a Dream is a public speech that was delivered to over 250,000 people by civil rights activist Martin Luther King during the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom on August 28, 1963, in which he called for civil and economic rights and an end to racism in the United States. Here is the conclusion of that speech. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day not be judged by the color of their skin, by the content of their character. I have a dream today. This will be the day when all God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring. From the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania, let freedom ring. From the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado, let freedom ring. From the curvaceous, curvaceous slopes of California, but not only that, let freedom ring. From the Stone Mountain of Georgia, let freedom ring. From the Lookout Mountain of Tennessee, let freedom ring. From every hill and every mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last.
Truss is an environmental attorney who has an amazing capacity to connect protecting the environment with benefits to the economy, the well-being of the interconnected web of life, and a livable future. He's the smartest guy I know on this topic. Please welcome Skip Cross. Good morning, all. So when Mary asked me to do this, it was daunting and a little bit intimidating, but Mary is not to be refused. <laughs> I have a dream where the urgency of the climate crisis becomes a unifying force, enabling all to recognize our mutual interests and interdependencies, and awakening the best within us to common purpose. I have a dream that we realize that we cannot burn our way to a better world, that we forthwith enable a, a historic transformation to a carbon-free economy, where sources of producing energy, technologies like wind and solar, work with nature and not against it, and where infinite nature-based resources displace oil, gas, and coal, which are finite and ecologically and climactically toxic. I have a dream that government will someday soon be wise enough to account fully for the economic and ecological costs of activities that affect the planet when formulating and implementing public policy, and that government will recognize the value of maintaining the functionality, vitality, and resilience of natural systems. I have a dream that we recognize the fragility and complexity of the biosphere and that we finally have the political will and wisdom to embrace the precautionary principle and enact laws informed by science and policy informed by deeper knowledge and circumspection. I have a dream that decisions will be made based upon how they will affect our children and future generations and that we recognize the importance of intergenerational equity and fully embrace the adage, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Yes. Lastly, I have a dream where we all embrace an ethic of respect for all living things and a conscious appreciation of the gifts that nature provides, that the earth's biodiversity and abundant resources are appreciated for the multiple benefits and ecological services they provide and that we will garner the wisdom and will to cherish the national world, repair what we have broken, and begin to restore what we have lost.
Our next speaker is Gladys Munoz, and she's the director of the Justice and Peace uh, Advocacy Center, um, and involved in many, many other uh, nonprofits. Um, and she's been um, in actively involved in the Hispanic immigrant and migrant community in northern Michigan for more than 30 years. She's been doing amazing work, and we are truly privileged to have her with us today. Uh, so now we'll hear from Gladys Munoz. In the beginning, we were a country of nations before it became a nation of immigrants. The foundations of the original nations support, without realizing it, the work of the immigrants that follow, a work that has made and continue to make this nation great. Money without the labor force or without the spirit life does not build nations. Machines do not work on their own, and crops are not self-picked. The native spirit and the immigrant drive protects this nation that we all consider home. We are all natives or immigrants in this nation, either by birth, by choice, or by force. We are all natives and, or immigrants. And natives and immigrants are the ones that build and continue to build roads, buildings, and the infrastructure that support this nation's economy. Natives and immigrants are the ones that pick this nation's food source, which sustains this nation that we all call home. Natives and immigrants care for their children and for this nation's children. Natives and immigrants bring new life to dying towns and vibrant worship to dying communities. <coughs> Natives and immigrants, old and young, challenge us to appreciate the earth and its connectedness. I have a dream and my dream is that we will be open to one another's gifts and find common ground to sustain us, to reconcile with each other, to respect and give back the dignity stolen. The diversity, the kaleidoscope of people's ideas and beliefs is what gives this nation, our nation, its identity. It's the force that generates life. My vision is not of a melting pot, but instead of a salad bowl, which by the way, it's, it's, it's healthier. <laughs> <laughs> Where each person and each community has a place, an opportunity, a responsibility to make this nation our nation. To make this nation one nation to make this nation one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you.
Jim Olson is one brilliant environmental attorney on using the rule of law and common sense to protect our waters. My first memory of his work was back when the tribal fishermen and the sport fishermen were really going at it over fishing rights in the Great Lakes. It was Jim who redirected the focus to whether the fish caught would be even safe to eat. Please welcome our lifelong protector of the beautiful Great Lakes. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Skip. Gladys, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I want to say, that um, what I'm, <clears throat> the dream I have, I actually have left uh, uh, some writing, six copies or five or six copies, you can make more. Uh, that way uh, you'll get the, the concrete parts of what I'm gonna say. Uh, also, I had a dream in 2009 and 2010. And uh, what I, and that was to, bring the public trust doctrine into the world of understanding and debate of our world's commons and what to do about them. I had that dream not <clears throat> because um, uh, of some uh, artistic vision. It was a dream that came out of the battle over the privatization of water on the part of Nestle to turn water from a commons that is used into water that is sold, so that corporations can make not just people of color slaves, but every person and being on the planet slaves. And thus was born flow for love of water. That dream is a reality, thanks to Skip Pross, who was the director of our board, of, or chairman of our board for many years. That dream is a reality because of many people understanding that this time in history, we cannot afford to view the natural world as apart from us. It is a common gift from the creation. It preceded the human mind. The human mind is a tool, but if the, and, and if we honor this dream of the commons as being paramount to serving all life, we will then defeat our human nature desire to control at short gain, at tremendous cost. I have a dream that this commons will be protected by the public trust doctrine, which many of you have heard many of us at Flow continue to talk about. But this is not an idea, it comes from 2,000 years ago. The dream started centuries ago. The dream was buried. I have a dream that this buried of the commons that we have lost in Western civilization 
We'll, we'll come back and we'll, we will understand that all private property has no value, that all life has no value unless we preserve and protect the commons of Earth. I have a dream that we understand that the hydrosphere is our being. The hydrosphere is the being in which we live, and it is the commons. I have a dream that the hydrosphere and the people in it and the beings in it will be protected by the public trust doctrine. Not a lawsuit every time it's needed, but I have a dream that the lawsuit can be filed and will stop the tyranny. It will stop the tyranny of climate change, the fires in Australia. I have a dream that it will stop the destruction of people in Flint. I have a dream that there will be no shutoffs of any person, child, grandparent on this earth because they don't have the ability to pay for water. Water is a commons. We must serve and treat it with dignity for all. I have a dream that this public trust doctrine will assure that water is always public. I have a dream that we will assure that this water is generational and it will be protected from one generation to the next. I have a dream that it will apply to all people. I have a dream that we will understand that we are in relationship that the public trust doctrine does not just protect the water, it, does, it protects people and life, that it protects the relationship between people and life. I have a dream that if we understand this relationship between people and life and beings like Lake uh, Erie, which one third of which is a, a green toxic soup, I have a dream that we will understand that we understand that this is us and that because of that, in the future, we will come to a peace on this earth, the peace that exists in the relationship that was created between the commons and us when we entered this earth, however that happened. I have a dream that we can move forward together uh, to accomplish all the things by the speaker is here today and what's in our hearts. Thank you. All my relations come. Every nation come. All my relations on. We are one, we are praying, come, we are praying, come, we are the song and we are the drum, we are one, we are the
As we extinguish our chalice, let us keep alive the fire of our commitment to realize our dreams for a better world. With hearts full of gratitude, we thank Mike Jackson, Gladys Munoz, Skip Pross, Jim Olson, Gary Devil, Kim Greeby, Rick Evans, Heather Hingham, and TC Sings, along with our vocal ensemble, soloists Shelley Burns, and director Renee Russell. You have inspired us all. And we hope that the inspiration of these shared dreams will be remembered. But even more important is we want you to make your own dreams. Take the time to make them and have the strength to hold them and take action. If we all do that, this world will be a beautiful, peaceful, just, and sustainable world for all. Blessed be. Ooh.